Hey, Victory, welcome to another Sunday morning. So glad you tuned in with us. You may have been watching now for a couple weeks and you're wondering who this wonderful person is. This is Kat and Hi, she is the new addition to our praise and worship team. So uh, welcome her and just kind of clap at home. That's what we'll do, clap at home. <laughs> and Kat, let me ask you this, just to help people get to know you. What is your absolute favorite movie? Top of your head, favorite movie. Oh, First thing that popped movie. in your mind. Favorite movie? Anything. Mean Girls. Mean Girls. There you go. That's my favorite, too. Actually, I've never seen that. It sounded too mean. Welcome to Victory, and thank you for worshiping with us.
Hi, church family, Kim here. We're gonna get ready to take communion together. I love being able to take communion with you all this morning because I've always just really noticed that it builds that friendship and strengthens those relationships between us as a church family, really creates that bond of unity. And I know that I need that going into this month of June. So let's get ready, pull together the friends and family you have with you right now. Get something to take communion with. I'm using juice and a muffin, but you really can use anything you have on hand. I'd like to start by reading two scriptures. And those verses can be found in Romans chapter 5, 1 and 2. And this is what it says. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. I chose these two scripture verses because they have three key words in it that I really need in my life right now. And those are peace, grace, and hope. Paul really paints a picture, and it's an amazing picture, of what the normal Christian life should be like. How we can, as believers, receive these blessings that come to us through faith in Jesus Christ. This place of standing before God, our God. Nothing between us but peace, at peace with our God. No guilt, no shame, no sin. And that we have uh, grace. You know, that grace, that kindness, that favor of the Lord available to us, full access to have grace for our life and everything we deal with, but also for others. Everything we need, full access. And, and then hope, that hope that reaches out into the future, sees an intention God has for us, no matter what our situation is that we're going through, gets that intention of God, pulls it back by faith and declares it into our life. The hope of God, that is amazing. But you know, I find that as much as I love walking in those things and sometimes do pretty well with it, there are days that my heart just is not, uh, solid in it that I just am kind of shaken and it's like I've gotten out of alignment you know and it's usually because of the troubles around me or something I'm experiencing with a family member in fact right now I have a very close family member someone that I have loved my whole life that is in jail and I've gone through the full range of emotions of pain and sorrow and hurt and anger, and also guilt. Because I look back at times when I feel like I should have done something and I didn't, or I shouldn't have said that thing, but I did. And you know what, all of those emotions sometimes just really get me off course. Communion is a great time for us to stop and to really search our hearts and think, you know, is that happening in my heart right now? Am I experiencing the peace and the grace and the hope of the Lord like I'm supposed to be? Or am I feeling like something's off? So right now, we're going to go ahead and pray together. And if you can identify that need in you, then agree with me in prayer. Then after prayer, we can go ahead and go on to enjoy communion and enjoy the proclaiming of the all the fullness of goodness that God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray together, church family. God, I thank you for all of the ones that are listening this morning. God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that searches everything out. And right now, Lord, I know you're going through our hearts and you're showing us places that we need you to touch, that we need you to help us to forgive, help us to forgive others, help us to forgive ourselves. God, sometimes we are the biggest critics of ourselves. God, help us to apply your forgiveness to those areas and really get freedom from it. Lord, we forgive everyone that we can think of right now that has hurt us. And Lord, we receive your forgiveness. God, we celebrate what you did on the cross. We could take communion together now, even when it's online, we're one church family. And we celebrate you, Jesus. And we love that we are your believers and that you are at work in our life. God, we bless C3 Victory family. And we just look forward to this coming month together. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hey, Victory. Thank you for tuning in again this another Sunday that we have one more week before we get to meet in person. We're so excited about the opportunity to worship together next Sunday at 10 a.m. I wanted to launch into a new series this week because um, throughout all the stuff that's been going on, one of the things that our, uh, our president has said is that the church is an essential service. He said that a couple of weeks ago. And ever since he said that, I've really been thinking about it. Our pastoral team, we've been thinking about what does that exactly mean? Because 
we believe that uh, the church is an essential service and there's things that God has called the church to offer and that the church brings to the world that nobody else does. And so we wanted to start a series called The Essentials. The Essentials. And this is what we're doing. We're addressing those things that specifically the church is called to speak to. I believe right now that we're in a time when God has called the church to be a city that's set on a hill to shine like never before, to, to, to stand up for those that aren't able to stand up, to be a voice for those whose voices have been silenced. I believe that that's part of the church's job. And so we're going to be getting into it uh, this morning. And so we're going to be looking at a couple different scriptures. And I'm going to set it up a little bit this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 28. We're going to pray and read the word together. Father, we just thank you so much for your scripture. God, I thank you for your power. God, I thank you for your grace, God, that moves through us, that empowers us, God, to carry out your will in the earth. Jesus, I I just thank you for every person right now that's crying out, Lord, here I am, use me. And Father, we just pray that in everything that's going on, Lord Jesus, that uh, you would cause your grace and your mercy and your truth to flow out of our lives into the world in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get into the word this morning and uh and unpack this. Throughout this series, I'm going to keep coming back to this scripture because in it I think is the key that we have to get our minds around as a church. Matthew 28. If you've never heard of this, this is called the Great Commission the Great Commission, and he's talking to everybody, everybody that has ever said yes to Jesus, you come under the Great Commission. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee. We're in Matthew 28, 16. Then the disciples, the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some, listen, but some of them doubted. They worshiped him, but even some of them were still doubting. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always even to the end of the age. And I want to stop for a moment and I want to I want to look at this phrase where he says baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said this, we've got to understand. He wasn't given the church like this uh this catchphrase when you dunk people underwater. Like okay, here's the catchphrase. Every time you put someone underwater, say I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and come back up. It wasn't, it wasn't a catchphrase. It was like a very intentional information to be given to us so that we know what people need to know, what people need to be immersed in. When you look at that word baptism, it comes from the Greek word baptismo, which means to immerse, to surround, to go completely under where it's all around you. And so what he was saying here is he was saying, when, when you go into all the nations, Immerse them in the name of the Father, immerse them in the name of the Son, and immerse them in the name of the Holy Spirit. That when we're going out and we're making disciples, that we want to unpack each one of these. So this is is what I want us to see in here. Each one of these aspects of God is areas that we have to grow in so that we can go out and be the light that God has called us to be. Only, only through the body of Christ, only through the church, are we able to show people what it means to be immersed in the name of the Father, immersed in the name of the Son, immersed in the Holy Spirit. Each one of these characteristics of God offers something. For example, when you get immersed in the Father, then you're being immersed into the family of God where we begin to gain who we are, our identity in Christ, who we are 
and who he's, what he's called us to do. And so we've got to immerse people in that. We've got to immerse people in what it means to be followers of Jesus. We've got to immerse people in what it means to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to immerse people in all these. It's not a, it's not a catchphrase. And the church is an essential service. The church is the only organization. It's the only body. It's the only family on earth that can go and carry out this task. I want to show us exactly where this all comes from. When I say we're the only ones who can do this, I want to show us something in here. Jump with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is what it says. In verse 11, it says, Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere. And I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So, we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the, sin off, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Okay, so I, I read all that scripture, and I read it because I wanted us to see something in this great commission. And this is what I want us to see. The moment that you said yes to Jesus, the moment that you said, I want to give my life to him, then immediately you stepped into not just saying yes to Jesus, but yes to the calling of Jesus, which is to reconcile people back to God. In other words, you were given the ministry of, of reconciliation. What this means is when you said yes to Jesus, this, this commission became your commission. This, this goal became your goal. This is, this is why it's up here, is to see that the moment we said yes to Jesus, that we were uh, fully empowered and fully called to do what God has called us to do. What's really interesting about this is when, when you look at Scripture, Jesus, while he, was, he, while he was on the earth, before he went to the cross, is he said, I am here to do the will of the Father. See, Jesus wasn't about carrying out his own will and what he wanted. Jesus was about doing the will of, of the Father because he recognized that there was something specific that God had for him to accomplish on the earth. And so that's exactly what, what he did. But then we see something different here in this moment. In this moment, when Jesus calls these 11 disciples up to him, this is what he's saying. I've accomplished everything that the Father has given me. And then he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So now you go. So in other words, things shifted for Jesus to where uh, up until the moment when he came out of that grave, 
He, he was doing the will of the Father. Now, Jesus had a new mission, and Jesus' new mission was to build the church. Jesus' new mission was to, to gather the body of Christ, that's you and me, those who have said yes to Jesus, and say, now, go out into all the world, go out into every nation, go out into every place, and immerse them in who I am. Immerse them in who the living God is. And he's saying, so you and I, we're reconcilers. We, we walk in the ministry of reconciliation. I don't know if there's a time on the earth where this has been more critical than right now. I don't know if there's been a time where it's been more critical, where, where God has called us to go out and to be a people of reconciliation. You're watching this on a, on a Sunday, uh, probably, and uh, I want you to know that at 6 p.m., uh, 6 p.m. that Sunday, June 7th, at the Patty Dotson, there's going to be a, a march, and it's, it's called Black Lives Matter, and there's going to be a march in Victoria, and our church is going to be a part of that. I recognize that uh, not everybody agrees with every aspect of Black Lives Matter, and you know, and that's that's your own opinion, and you're welcome to it. But this is this is why we're getting involved is because um, of this this one statement: Black people matter, Black lives matter. There, this is a nation of equality, and it's your job and it's my job as believers, if you are a believer, to be the people that stand up and say, these people's lives matter. These people's lives matter. I understand that there can be a lot of uh, politics that go into it. There may be other parts that you disagree with, and that's all fine and good. But as the church, we should all be able to say that black people, black lives matter. For me, it was... Um, my, my whole journey with this, just to be a little bit transparent right now, was uh, I, I had a hard time with that statement because this is what I always came back with is all lives matter. All lives matter. And, uh, and so I, I, said, I said, you know, when you say all lives matter, that naturally includes black people. So all lives matter. Why can't we just say all lives matter? And then a really good friend of mine put out, put out this blog and it got me to see something differently because it got me to see through the eyes of a father. And he said, if, if you're a father, let's say you have four or five kids and one of your kids has uh, contracts a disease or a virus and it is killing them. It is killing them. And so you do everything you can to take care of that kid. You get them to the hospital. You try to get them the best care. And so it, picture you having this kid that is in the hospital and that's, that's suffering and you fear for their life. And, and, so, and, and so you're trying to get people to pray with you and believe and say, hey, I need healing for this kid. I need healing for my son or our daughter. I need a miracle for them. And they come back with you, well, you know, all, all your kids matter, not just this one. That's such a stupid statement to say when a father is watching their child die, when they're, when, when they're watching them just be completely eradicated. And, and to, when, whenever he wrote that, it, it really opened my eyes to say, just because you say, and just because we're focusing on the one that's hurting, doesn't mean, and it doesn't degrade, and it doesn't devalue the rest of the kids. And so I want you to look at it from the standpoint of a father and a father God. If, if there was a, a system in place, if there was people that were trying to eradicate that, you would say, listen, my child's life matters. And it's your job and my job as the church to be the people that stand up and say their life matters. Their life matters. It's, it, we're kind of living in this world where people want to draw lines and say, well, if you stand up and you, and you march with them, that means you believe everything that they believe. And that's not true. We believe this statement. Black people matter. They were created equally in the image of God. That's what matters. That's why we march. That's where, why we're going out there. And it's easy to uh, put politics behind it. It's easy to put all these different things to, behind it and to give us an excuse just to stay home. But let me, let me tell you, as your pastor, if I'm your pastor, don't fall into that trap. Come out with us and I'm going to be there. Or we're going to walk in. We're going to march because we believe in this church, we believe that all people, regardless of race, regardless of gender, were created equal in the image of God. Male and female, he created them both. 
And we will stand firm on that and we will proclaim it. And, and we've got to remember that as believers, that this, this is us. This is who God has called us to be. That he has called us to be ministers of reconciliation, to be a voice of, uh, to the people from God saying, hey, come to him. Your life matters. You matter to God. You're important. You were born on purpose, for a purpose. And let it be about that. Let's not give in to uh, inactivity and let's not give in to criticism and figure out all the reasons why we shouldn't when the reason why we should is so clear. Maybe you're watching this and um, maybe you just don't know what to do. Maybe you're one of those people that you've been, you've been searching and you say, listen, I don't even, I don't know about, about Jesus. I don't know about all these different, different things. I don't know what to do. Listen, what it starts with is relationship with Christ. That's where it always starts. When Jesus called these 11, he didn't call them because they were the most educated. The Pharisees were more educated in the law than the 11. And when you look at the scripture and it says he called them, it says uh, some of them doubted. Verse 17, but some of them doubted. So it's not like they even had perfect faith. Some of them were like, I don't even know if this is Jesus. This could be a ghost. This, this could be a big scam. I, I, don't, I don't know. But they, st they, they showed up. And, and this, is, this is the thing. Jesus called the people that spent the most time with him. That, that was like the qualifier. It, was, it wasn't that they were like these super invincible apostles. It's that they spent time with Jesus. And so if you're wondering where to start, let me tell you, you've got to start with spending time with the Lord. You've got to spend time. We can't go out and be ministers of reconciliation to a God that we're disconnected to. And so wherever you're at this morning, whatever your struggle is, run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. If there's, some, if there's some things that you're like, man, I don't know about this and I don't know how this is going to shake out. Well, guess what? Join the club. Join the club because no one's got it figured out and no one knows exactly what's going to happen. But our mission is clear. Our mission is clear. We are called to make Jesus know. We are called to be the church and we are not called to be silent. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you for, um, God, I thank you for every person that's watching this. And Lord, I know there's a lot of questions. I know that there's a lot of maybe even disagreements and, and wonderings. But Lord, we can all agree with this, that Lord, we want to make your name known. And we realize that as your body, as your church, God, you have called us to stand up for those that can't stand up for themselves. God, you've called us to be a voice for those whose voices have been silenced. God, you've called us to bring change to those who are, are being victimized and oppressed. God, to bring liberty, liberty to those who are oppressed, to those who are captives. You've called us to that. To, God, to be uh, freedom ministers. God, to bring uh, people healing and hope. God, you've called us to it. And Lord Jesus, that's what we're going to do. God, I just thank you for it, Father. We, we lean into you, God, because from you comes the grace, the mercy, and the hope that we need. God, we look to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching this. Have an awesome Sunday. I hope to see you this evening, 6 p.m. at the Patty Dotson Health Center. Hi, C3 Victory family. My name is Melissa Orr, and I am honored to share with you a giving message. So my favorite passage is out of the Amplified Bible, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It says, let each one give thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver and delights in the one whose heart is his gift. God has blessed my husband and I tremendously. And I do believe that it started with the seed we sowed many years ago. We were visiting a church and my husband leaned over to me and said, God wants me to give X amount. I looked at him like he had, was crazy because there was only X amount in the bank account. We did. Me, I had a grudging heart, but God knew my husband's heart and he was able to bless us out of that. And I pray that you would sow a seed, no matter what that seed would be, back into C3 Victory.
I, personally, I like to use our text to give. Let me give text to give number is 361-541-4471. It's one of my favorite ways to give because it's really simple. When God blesses me with, let's say $20, 10% of that is $2. So I just go in here and text $2 to, to my text to give. I pray that God blesses you more than that and he brings an abundance to you and just know that when you sow a seed into C3 victory, you are truly sowing into God's kingdom. And it's not just about that. It's truly a matter of the heart. So when you're out in our community and you want to bless someone, our family has at times blessed the car behind us and paid for their meals. We didn't want anything out of it. We just wanted to bless someone. And I pray that you would do the same thing. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend.